Hello, greetings to you all. Well, welcome to another episode in the Genesis series. This is um, Genesis number series number 11, and this is the point where the flood begins to subside. <clears throat> We're coming to the end of the actual flood. And uh, in our previous video, that would have been uh, Genesis series number 10, we looked at the actual ravages of the flood um, that, that came upon the world and, of course, mankind and the animals. And we also discussed um, Noah's physical health, that he would uh, suffer some disadvantages in his health. Today, we'd call that work-related injuries or side effects. So we're going to pick up now Genesis uh, chapter 8 verses 1 to 14 and uh, again we're coming in on where the floodwaters are receding but I just want you all to remember as we go through this video that um, it was a different world now. The um, topography of the earth or the, or the physicality of the actual earth has changed. In many ways, it's a new world, a different world than before. So we're going to begin uh, now with when um, Noah sends out the raven and then, of course, the dove. So what I will do is I will actually read those Torah verses, 1 to 14, and then we'll take a peek at and see if there's any layers in the Torah anthology that are of note for us. So I will begin now, Genesis chapter 8, verses 1 to 14. And it's subtitled, The Waters Recede. So God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God caused a spirit to pass over the earth and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed and the rain from heaven was restrained. The waters then receded from upon the earth, receding continuously, and the waters diminished at the end of 150 days. And the ark came to rest on the seventh month of the seventh day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. The waters were continuously diminishing until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first of the month, the tops of the mountains became visible. And it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. He sent out the raven and it kept going and returning until the waters dried from upon the earth. Then he sent out the dove from him to see whether the waters had subsided uh, from the face of the ground. But the dove could not find a resting place for the sole of its foot, and it returned to him to the ark, from the, for the water was upon the surface of all the earth. So he put forth his hand, meaning Noah, and took the dove, took it and brought him into the ark. He waited again another seven days and again sent out the dove from the ark. The dove came back to him in the evening and behold, an olive leaf it had plucked within its bill. And Noah knew that the waters had subsided from upon the earth. Then he waited again another seven days and sent the dove forth and it did not return to him again. Verse 13 goes on. And it came to pass in the 600th and first year, in the first month of the first of the, of the month, the waters dried from upon the earth. Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the surface of the ground had dried. And in the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was fully dried. Now that, in terms of our secular common era calendar, equates to um, October the 27th. Now, um, 
before I go to uh, the uh, commentary, Torah commentary, just recall that I do have um, a documents page on my website and you will see a link to that in the script description box below. And there I put each, after each video, I put reference texts, etc. And I there will be a, um, a copy of that chronology of the flood. So that uh, just for interest's sake, you can look at what happened during all those months and uh, the dates that they occurred. And there'll be secular dates there for you to look at. So let's look at Torah commentary now on these 14 verses that we've just looked at. So we, uh, the Torah commentary here uh, gives a, a sort of a overall of the verses 1 to 8. So we'll look at what that says. And it commences, this chapter recounts the onset of God's mercy as the waters begin to recede. And the earth slowly reached the stage where Noah could begin to resettle the earth and resume normal life. Um, God remembered. This is to say that to say that God remembers implies that forgetfulness is possible for Him, which is clearly an absurdity. So the Torah explains that. It uses this term, like many others, to make it easier for us to understand the course of events. God's wisdom had decreed that up to this point uh, he should ignore the plight of his creatures as if he had forgotten them. Now, when he was ready to show him the mercy, it was as if he had remembered. The commentators state that Noah earned this mercy because he fed and cared for the animals during all the months that they were in the ark. God remembered that the animals that were permitted to enter the ark had not previously perverted their ways and they had refrained from mating in the ark. He noted that Noah was a perfectly righteous man and there was a divine covenant to save him. Concerning the animals, God remembered his plan that the earth should continue with the same species as before. Now this goes on here and it says a spirit. The translation follows Rashi and many commentators. Rombom and others render wind. The spirit or wind caused the waters to stop their seething, boiling fury. And in verse 2, it sealed the sources of the water so that the flood could begin to recede. So it's always good to um, look at these comments. They bring... Um, uh, not only another layer of understanding, but they give us explanations because I've often said to you previously, the Torah doesn't waste one letter, one tittle of a word. Uh, everything is precise and conserved and not wasted. So this is why these commentaries are very important for us to, to fill in um, our, our human understanding. So the commentary uh, expands further now on verses three to six. On the first of seven, the seventh month and 150 days from the 27th of Kislev, when the rain ended, the waters began to recede. And on the 17th day of seven, the bottom of the ark rested onto Mount, Mount Ararat. It was not until the 10th month from the beginning of the rain that the, uh, uh, that the mountain tops became visible. 40 days after that, interesting 40 days again, after that Noah opened the skylight of the ark to learn when it would be possible to leave the ark and to begin to re-establish normal life um, on earth. Now it talks about sending forth the raven and this is interesting. Uh, Noah wanted to test whether the air was still too moist for the raven to tolerate. It was for the raven kept circling back and forth. Moreover, the raven returned with nothing in its mouth, indicating that vegetation had not yet begun to grow. Ravens feed on carrion of man and beast. Noah reasoned that if the raven would bring some back, it would be proof 
that the waters had dis descended enough for the raven to have found some carrion on the ground. The raven continually flew to and fro until Noah left the ark when the earth had dried, meaning dried completely. Commentary goes on now between verses 8 and 12. Now, the dove, seven days after sending the raven, Noah set the dove free. If it would find a resting place, it would not return. Although the mountain tops were, at, um, were already visible, the bird would not consider them a resting place because they were denuded of trees. In other words, there was no vegetation or perching spot for it. So that the dove could not build a nest uh, or because the land was still saturated from the long flood. Commentary on verse 9 continues. So he put forth his hand and took it. Noah's compassion teaches us that one should treat an unsuccessful messenger as well as a successful one if the failure was not his fault. See, there's always a lesson in every part of Torah, always. So verse 11 commentary, the dove came back to him. By saying that the dove came back to him, the Torah implies that it meant to come back to Noah in fulfilment of its mission to bring back a sign of God's response. The bird did not come back merely to return to its nest or because it was tired. By bringing back a bitter olive in its mouth, the dove was saying symbolically, this is interesting, Better that my food be bitter, but from God's hand, than sweet as honey, but dependent on mortal man. Um, for a full year, the dove could not earn its own food. Hunger forced it to rely on Noah's kindness. Then it found a bitter leaf that it would ordinarily not eat. And he carried it back to Noah, preaching the lesson of the sages that even the bitterest food eaten in freedom is better than the sweetest food given in servitude. Commentary for verse 13. The earth dries. The earth's surface had dried, but it was not yet firm enough to walk upon. Noah waited for God's command before leaving the ark. Verse 14 commentary. When the rains began uh, to the 27th of Marshevan of the following year, when Noah was finally able to leave the ark, was a full solar year, making 365 days that the earth was uninhabitable. So that brings us to um, the end of the commentary on um, verses 1 to 14. So it's all very interesting and I understand that sometimes it's a lot to take in all at once but um, it's always a good idea perhaps to re-watch this video and pause it and just you know look in, in your uh, Tanakh or your Torah if you have one and um, read those verses for yourself. It, it does make sense after a while. So we go and we look at the Torah anthology on these verses. Now, um, one of the things that the Torah anthology says, and again, these page numbers, etc., will be referenced on the documents page. But anyway, on page 366, it says that the Torah informs us that Noah knew the language of animals and birds. And um, he was therefore able to tell the raven what to do and to send it on a mission. You know, that's not too hard to believe because I even in our modern days, we have people that, um, you know, uh, for instance, can communicate in, in a way, I say communicate in inverted commas, because um, you hear of things like the horse whisperer. Now, we in, in, in our um, life and our family history, we've known many people that, you know, you can have a horse that's having troubles or you're not managing it is to its best ability. And uh, there are people that can just pick it up in an instance. They say, get on your horse and ride it, you know, and then next thing 
they know exactly what the problem is. And they often can rectify it almost immediately simply by changing how you behave or um, giving the horse a different cue, uh, not confusing the horse, etc. We have many people that train dogs, you know, working dogs to herd cattle. They can sit and watch and crouch and they can see a, um, a, a beast or a sheep right on the edge looking like it's going to move and break and that way the mob would follow them and that dog can be there in a second but that has to be trained it has to learn from other more senior dogs and of course it's handler so it's not hard to believe that Noah could understand uh the language probably literally uh while he was in the ark and you know Noah was a righteous man he certainly would have had uh, assistance in, in being able to manage that immensely valuable cargo that he had, all the passengers. So that was something I thought I would just mention. So there are people that can actually understand animals. Not, And you've only got to look at your own dog. Uh, it, 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 I can tell by the look on my two little dogs' face, I, I know exactly what they're trying to tell me. And they know when I you know, I'm really busy or it's a firm command, I say, no, and point the finger down towards them. They know straight away that's the end of the discussion. So in many ways, we do communicate with our animals, but not to the extent I'm sure that Noah was able to. So we move on with Torah anthology here. Um, now, this is interesting uh, an interesting uh, layer from Torah Anthology. It says, stubbornly, the raven refused to leave the vicinity of the ark. Uh, it saw a human corpse and began to devour it. Now, we don't know. Um, uh, I've not read that uh, before. When it returned to the ark, Noah refused to let it in. God then told Noah to accept the raven since it would later bring benefit, meaning to, in the future. And that, of course, when Elijah had to flee the cave after rebuking Ahab, when it, had, when it did not rain for three years, it was the ravens who brought him food from Jehovah's, Jehoshaphat's table. And that is in 1 Kings verse, uh, chapter 17, verse 6, if you care to look it up. That's 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 6. So no stone is left unturned with a sham, is it? So I just thought that was interesting to let you know that um, bit of information. Now, we go over with Torah Anthology, and there's a few points here uh, uh, the chronology of the Great Flood is um, is listed and that is what I will put up on um, the document page on the website um, and uh, you can just, I think it's just interesting to look at the enormity of time, a whole year, and you can sort of look at it in our dates as well as the Hebrew dates or the common era dates and Hebrew dates. So the flood actually lasted from the 27th of October to the 27th of October on the following year. So, um, and it says about when the earth became completely dry, which is the same as what we read before. Now, here we see that the judgment of the great flood lasted exactly 12 months, solar months. The people were judged with both fire and water, these being the punishments of purgatory. The rain was as cold as ice, while the subterranean waters that welled up from the ground were extremely hot. And we've touched on this before in previous videos. So um, it's interesting to note that a lot of people didn't don't realise that the temperature of the waters. Um, and so uh, the Great Flood began and ended on October 27th, it goes on. Now, there's another layer here from Torah Anthology and um, I hesitated whether to um, read this out, but I think I think it's... Oh, look, it's raining here today and we've got sticky flies coming around. Bit, bit like being in the ark, only not, not as bad. 
Um, I wonder what happened. I wonder were there flies in the ark? I, I expect so. Mm. The corpses. Now, let's look at this. The corpses. This is Torah anthology, page three hundred and seventy. It's the second last paragraph. It begins. The corpses of all the people killed by the flood were washed down to Babylon, which is now modern day Iraq. The area was therefore known as Shinar, uh, meaning agitate, or it belongs to a root word which means agitate. All these corpses were agitated and swept into this area. It is therefore said that eating the soil of Babylon is like eating one's own ancestors. Mm. A bit grisly, isn't it? But I just thought that was interest that's an interesting liar. Um I actually have never heard a rabbi speak about that. So that's why I hesitated as to whether I would mention that. But, you know, it, it, uh, it's interesting to ponder that. And uh, so it goes forth and it says that the wellsprings of the deep were sealed without using the word all. Now, this is interesting. This alludes to the fact that a number of these wellsprings remained open including the hot springs of Tiberias and similar places. And there are places throughout the world that have sort of um, hot springs. These springs have a sulfurous taste and, but have, and have curative properties. This demonstrates God's greatness. He punishes and heals with the same agent. Now, I grew up as a child always, where we lived, uh, we had artesian bores and uh, the water came out hot some were very hot but some were you know hot but you could certainly swim in them and it always had a peculiar odor and many people swear by them for rheumatoid and arthritic type of complaints or if someone's had a broken limb they say that the water that are very helpful to them you can't drink the water it uh, it has a a flat sort of a taste and some bores are more pure than others sometimes the artesian water is so soft it's like rainwater but it still has a peculiar taste and odor so you're not inclined to want to actually drink it but they're, they're dotted probably throughout the world but in australia there's quite a few in certain areas and um they're uh the water that comes out of those, um, they dig big drains and the water, because it flows continuously, and as it flows further from the bore, the water cools, and that's the main source of water for stock in a lot of areas, especially in western parts and uh, more arid parts of um, Australia where cattle and sheep graze, etc. So they provide a, ble a great blessing, a great blessing. Okay, so that is uh, brings us up to the end of the Torah anthology in relation to um, uh, their commentary at the moment. Uh, one little paragraph here I will just read that um, um, still another reason uh, that is that all his troubles uh, atoned. So all the troubles Noah had in the ark and managing everything, plus his side effects of, you know, some ill health. Uh, all this trouble atoned for Noah's sins. God had therefore told Noah, make for yourself an ark. Uh, and that is Genesis 6, 14. God stressed that making the ark would be for Noah's own benefit. Through working on it for 120 years, uh, and the toiling without rest for 12 months taking care of the animals, all of Noah's sins would have been atoned for. So that's an interesting layer, isn't it? All right. Now, we have um, looked into that, and I think that we will end the video here and um, ponder on everything that we've, we've understood so far. And in our next uh, video, oh, and don't forget to go to the website and look at the documents page uh, for the, it'll be the, the most recent reference list is always the one at the top of the page. 
And um, so our next video, that'll be Genesis series number 12. We're going, it, it's all about leaving the ark, etc. And, um, you know, the, 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 the um, in, embracing this whole new world and the differences that came along with it. So please don't forget to subscri subscribe to my channel. And in the meantime, please take care and God bless.